They have had to scavenge the world in order to endear their lives to the pure. Move on. And it is informed by their policies in the Bismarck Conference of 1887, where their wars, which was about survival, had created a playing field that had narrowed. And because of that, they decided that Africa was a new place, a human a place that they were going to survive from, a place that they had then built, they would live their continued existence from. So they carved out this beautiful continent of ours. In fact, history is told how many of them talked about the African being a very pleasant person, a very ignorant person, a very welcoming person. You go visit, they are curious and happy to receive you. And you know why we are like that? Because we have been the land of plenty. We understood when you have guests, you karibu, karibu ni, come in. You know who are these strangers? You're welcome to a meal. Some cultures even said you're welcome Come to my wife. No, it's true. We were the land of the sun. We were the land where everything grew. We lacked nothing. We had happiness. We had culture. We had education. We had belief in even a greater being. We were happy. We were not about survival, but about existence and coexistence. And they said we have found ignorant people who we can play on. So they carved our continent. And what did they do when they carved our continent? They instituted something that we must never ever lose from our minds. Depending on where, because I can tell you even when they came here, they loved the weather in Kenya, but couldn't stand it in Nigeria. To them, that was mosquito infested. It was too humid. They could not live. They were dying. So they said, we will fully colonize Nigeria. But Kenya, we will. The weather is going to be we have mortality in a place called Kenya. So what drove them to institute systems and institutions or lack of it was simply their mortality in a particular area. But the basic principle was this. They came here to exploit our land. Because they needed to live. Never forget. They came to extract from our land. They came to exploit and extract from us as human beings. And they also came to dominate us. Because came source of survival. And as long as are their source of survival. Security was premised on their clear domination of us. So in 1887, they come here with a company called Royal East Africa Indian Company. And it had a mixture of our Wazungu and some Indians. That company changed in 1902 to Imperial British East Africa. And in 1902, we became a semi-colony. We were called a protectorate. So it was the first time the so-called British government was put in its hand here. By 1920, we became a colony. And the same company had, between 1902 and 1920, become the government. Kenya. So those people who came to extract, came to exploit, 
came to dominate. Became the government of Kenya. Now, I want you to imagine that I have come here to make profit and I become the government of Kenya. The watchmen that used to guard their properties became the policemen. I don't know whether you can imagine that and ask yourself whether anything has changed. Because for a watchman who was protecting the private company's property, the Adui were the people outside. Is that too different to the policeman today? Yes or no? That is what became the system. And out of it, as they extracted, as they exploited, as they dominated, no matter what they did, they always looked for something called a bailout from the British government. They took loan after loan, even after they built the railway. Loan after loan. That by the time we as Kenyans got our independence, we were a country in debt. That model did not work. So what has changed? We are still a government that is extracting, that is exploiting, and that seeks to dominate each and every one of us every day. So since independence, because we thought somewhere along the way, when we removed the Muzumbu, our own African will come and change the model. But we inherited the same system. The same system that the Mzumbo had implanted as a private enterprise to extract, to exploit, and to dominate. And we thought, hey, Anna, maybe we need greater political freedoms. We need greater political rights. And we chose the path of changing the constitution. We chose the path of introducing multi-parties. That is political rights. And we fought very hard. These halls of the university were battlegrounds in our, in our search for political rights. Nairobi has become a killing field under the Moi era for those political rights. And we got them, climaxed in 2010, with a constitution that has a rights charter unmatched anywhere in the world. So we have political rights. But are you richer? Are you richer? I'm asking you guys questions. No. Are you feeling richer? No. Are you feeling you have anything in your pockets? Yeah. Do you have disposable income? We are now 60 years plus after independence. And what is it that is not empowering us? Economically. It is this system. Because all it's doing from you is extracting from you. All it's doing from you is exploiting you. And when you question it, they sent the police to deal with you. Even though your rights, political rights, say they cannot. Even though they are told you cannot come inside that property, they come. Even though they are told you cannot arrest him, they arrest him. Even those in Nini. That is an infringement of our political rights guarantee in the Constitution. And if they can do it to me, I can assure you, each and every one of you are means meet to that system. <laughs> so, what is wrong? 
I'll tell you what's up. You are in a system that has planned your poverty. And it doesn't matter what year you go through here in school. And until you arrest this system that is planning your continued poverty, you are a slave to that system. And the system goes like this. And it was instituted by the same colonizers that needed it for their survival and their continued survival. The Mzungu is not about greatness. Even up until today, their mentality is survival. Please get it in you. Their domination, expansion, is about survival. That's why they talk about systems like democracy. Where there's no democracy, that is not something we understand, so it is a threat to us. That's why they build up arms among arms upon arms. Because to them, it's their survival, not their expansion. And their survival is premised on dominating areas where they exploit and extract for their survival. So it goes like this in this good country of ours. Because those who took up independence, those who took the shackles of power, who, who, who broke the shackles of the colonials, took on a system that they also many times did not understand, and when they did, they didn't mind it. Because they thought this is the best way to manage every single one of us. So it goes like this. 60% must remain below the poverty line. All you're looking for is food. If you get a meal per day, you are supposed to be a happy human. 30% are assigned. a health crisis away from poverty. And 10% are the ruling elite, of which only 1% are the true elite. If you understand that and accept, because all you need to do is look at numbers. If you accept that and take my theory, then you can divide yourself here and know that out of the cream that is here before me, only 1% will rise to the top. 60% of you will struggle. Now, if you want to doubt me, let's look at some numbers even on education. So 10.5 million kids go to primary school. About 3.9, call it 4 million, go to high school. So 6 million fall by the wayside. And how many are privileged to come to these corridors? Give me a number. Who knows? Do you know? Does anybody know? Yes? 207. Give him a big clap. So, from 10 million to 270, what is that percentage? What is that percentage? Two percent? Two point something percent? Give yourself a big clap. You are among the 2.7%. But you see how sad it is. How many 
of the offending have been shoved aside. And out of you 2.7%, how many of you believe you will get a job? How many? Right. So the system is rigged against you. You need to accept that, understand that. Because when you do, then you'll understand when we talk about an economic revolution. When we talk about changing the system. Changing what has been implanted in this country and most of South Saharan Africa. It is your revolution. It is the third liberation of this great land of ours. It is the future, your future, and that of your families. This is your time. It's your time to wake up and say, this system doesn't work, and we have to change it. And to change it, you need to understand I have been very specific over the last two years of what is our current slavery. And you need to understand it. And not get rid of it. Because I call it a snake. If you do not cut off the head of this snake, it doesn't matter what theories I give you. It doesn't matter what business plans I give you here, or great ideas we may have and share. You have a 60% chance of failing. The odds are stacked against you. This snake is very simply this. In order to continue exploiting, extracting, and dominating, they introduced an amazing weapon called debt. It's an amazing weapon. It takes everything from you. It melts you. Sucks in your life. And these people are clever. I have nothing against them, by the way. It's their survival. Right? We have got to start thinking of ours now, right? So we need to get our own plan. So I'm nothing against them. We just need to have our own plan. So we thought we fought for independence, and we did. In this country, we did. But the reason why, the most basic reason why, not only Kenya, but many African countries got independence. The most basic, I'll tell you is that it was the end, it was the beginning of what was called the Cold War. And the Western nations that had so dominated our continent were afraid that we would be liberated by the Communist East. So they decided to free us, give every single country independence, so that we adopt their, their ways, their Western ways of capitalism and their so-called democracy. Our second liberation, in as much as we had great heroes who fought, I can tell you because some of us were privy to the goings on at the time and participated. One of the most active embassies in this country for the second liberation was the US Embassy. We had an ambassador here called Ambassador Hemstrom. More used to call him the Nyamachama Ambassador because he's going to Nyamachama everywhere. And all you do is tell people, you people don't know economic rights. You must remove this, your, your political rights. You must remove this one party vehicle that has been instituted in you. And if you look at the period, as we were getting our second liberation, out there in the global north, the agenda was the end of the the end of the Cold War, they wanted to make sure 
that they have time to consolidate. Those were the times of huge economic gains for the West. And they wanted to make sure that this place that they wanted to continually dominate, because now you had a lot of dictators and powerful leaders that understood them, that could question them. They wanted to make sure that they got questioned in their own countries, and democracy has a way of doing that. It forces you to deal with your local issues. You saw when Ruto had Gen Z, he could not fly. He's not flying out. Because you have a country that's blowing up, you can't leave. So they wanted a situation where you are forced to be domesticated. With competition. While they consolidate their financial gains and wealth. If you look at history, the growth of the Brentwood Woods institutions was when we were busy here fighting for removal of one party states. That's what they were doing. They grew their financial markets and emerging markets beyond your imagination. Numbers that have never been imagined before. The US was printing the dollar like crazy and making sure it becomes the only currency making sure everything is dollar denominated, making sure it is the anchor of debt and the capital markets. And we are busy fighting for two ways to be removed so that we can have multi-party democracy. And when they grew, they now came back to offer the public branch. Comrades, are we together? They came back to start saying, oh, we're going to help you develop. Oh, we're going to do this. So us, who are busy trying to come out of our agrarian revolution, had misunderstood their intentions. As we were busy solidifying our independence and our second liberation, they were making sure they had policies, like the Common Agricultural Policy, some 1957, that went on into the 70s, both Europe and America, where food, which was plenty here, and don't follow the yardage that they came with cash crops, so we were not bringing our food for our existence. It's not completely accurate. Those are scapegoating manenos. We were still selling food to them. They were short of food. But they could not depend on us. They were afraid. So they created a policy that subsidized their farm and it still goes up until today. And took away our competitive edge to sell food. So we are still busy in the agrarian revolution. We can't even feed ourselves now. It's cheaper to bring from them. And they are subsidized. The European farmer, the American farmer, is subsidized. You try and do that here, you have failed beyond your imagination. And just as we were trying to find our way into industry, they come back and tell us, now the world is now liberalized. You must remove the tariff barriers to competitive industry. Because they have become very strong. We used to have a company here, and I'd like to use it as an example, called JK Industries. A man called Kalinga, from Machakos. He had a huge issue making telephones. Those days, if you didn't have your mobile phones, you had those phones you like this on the wall. And you had these call calls. And he had gone into that business and was doing very well. <clears throat> they were crushed by liberalization. They made sure that the so-called sub-policies that came in the 80s would open up our markets 
remove any tariff barriers to our growth, remove subsidies, and sink us into further poverty. And just as we were finding our feet, they come back to the dead. And more it consumed it. And they didn't know how to grow an economy. And this was the beginning of the next phase. So Moy leaves the country in 2002, let's cut the story short. And in 2002, Kibaki takes over and finds a GDP of negative one. First ever in our history, and I think the only time we ever had a negative growth rate. And Kibaki finds 170 billion was our tax collection. And Kibaki says, this is all just uh, mediocre business here. He tells IMF, I don't want your money. I don't need it. Get out of the office. Get out of the treasury. Tells both and go away, go away, go away. I don't need you. He tells the domestic banks, I don't need your money. Don't try and give me theories of money supply here. I don't need you. Get out. Go and look for 190 to loan them money. Interest rates came down to 3%. Can you imagine that? So Mamboka would take a million shillings and pay 30,000 shillings interest there. No, it was without security. And in 10 years, why Kipaki grew, grew tax revenue? From 170 billion to 1 trillion. Give that man a clap. And he did not let some people here not pretend they are, that they are following Mwai Kibaki by increasing your taxes. Mwai Kibaki did not increase anybody's taxes. He did not come back with punitive finance laws and deals. All he did was remove barriers to our growth. So that more people were earning and income. That's all. We had one TV and radio station. He said, what is that nonsense? Open it up. And it was opened up. And marketers could market a product in vernacular. Radio stations were earning incomes that they had never seen. The mobile phone grew under Mwai Kibaki. He had next to nothing. He found, I think, under Mwai, because Mwai had rescheduled his debt in the Paris Club conferences of 1995. He had rescheduled his debt. Just under 30% the tax revenue was going to debt. Mwai Kibaki, by the time he left, 13%, no, 18% was going to debt. And his intention was to bring it down to 13%. So he had a lot of revenue for government to function and to be the stimulus and catalyst to our economic emancipation. Any money he took or borrowed was very soft money. The Chinese came in in a big way at the time, and I can tell you it was very soft money. Some of us were big procurers of that, of that Chinese money. It was very soft. 22 to 32-year money. 2 or 3% interest rates. A lot of it was even written off. So, so here's the people. The government is down here. Development is here. And local money is here. He told people, pay your tax. Domestic money, I don't need it from your banks. Give it to the people. When they grow, they shall give me tax revenue. 
And with that tax revenue, I shall foster development. I shall do things like infrastructure, pick up road, southern bypass, all those things. I shall do it. I shall open up highway, roads, water, electricity, whatever the people need in a large scale. But please, give them the money. I will take it from their taxes. And we get my friend. I say he's my friend because he was my schoolmate for primary school. And William Samuel. And they decide. There are too many people in the 60% who are coming out to that 60%. They are becoming the uh, 30%. They don't listen to people. They are too comfortable in their houses. They are questioning things that we do. And this cannot be a way to manage them. I want to give you a contract example of that. You've heard of the Chinese-American trade agreement talks that happen every two years. When they talk about tariffs and negotiations, trade between the two largest economies in the world. The Democrats have a way of pushing democracy aggressively beyond their borders. So when Bill Clinton was there, I think the premier of China was, uh, was Paul Sun. Discuss discussions on that trade agreement were premised on China opening up to more democracy. More democracy. And Bill Clinton insisted, we are not signing until, for example, you allow the Chinese to have free travel beyond your borders, beyond their borders. It's harder to get in and out of China as a Chinese person than a foreigner, by the way. And Zhang said, I have no problem. We shall do it. I have 1 billion, 1.5 billion Chinese. I shall even open up TV. There, by the way, even if you go today, if CNN is showing and, they, and, and there's uh, anything about China, it, it just blacks out on the TV. Because such conversation just blacks out. They said, I'll look, make sure our TV opens up to you. The world. And Bernabin Clinton, it was agreed that when you have 300 million Chinese at the borders of New York coming Thank you very much. Hapa tuko na Honorable Dr. Babu Owino, a loving husband and a responsible father. Your favorite son. Leo hii tuko ndani ya Wasos TV. Stay tuned. Tibim.